Good morning. Y'all doing well today? All right. Wow. That was <laughs> really unenthusiastic. Y'all doing all right? All right. Goodness. Well, hey, we are in part two of a series called Voices, as Barry mentioned earlier. And last week, we talked about how powerful voices are. Um, if you weren't able to be with us last week, maybe you were visiting your mom for Mother's Day. I'd encourage you to go online and listen, because we talked about the voice of a particular woman from the Old Testament. Her name was Abigail, and she had a very powerful voice in the, man of Isra- or in the life of Israel's most famous king, a man named David. And uh, she was able to call something out of him that was so very important. And so if you've ever wondered, do, do Christians, does Christianity value women? The answer to that question is, Absolutely, absolutely, and last week was a perfect example of that. So again, if you missed it, please go online and and check that out. Now, voices are such a fascinating thing. I mean, we all have voices, right? We all have a voice. Some people, maybe you've met before, have like these teeny tiny itty bitty voices and you can barely hear them. And some people have loud, booming, you know, maybe even obnoxious voices or radio voices. Some people have not radio voices, you know. I mean, we've got all kinds of voices out there. Some people don't have physical voices, but they use their hands. They use sign language. Some people use their voices through literature, through art, through media, through film. I mean, voices span generations. Voices are such fascinating, fascinating things. We all have a voice. We all want our voice to be heard. And uh, what's, what's interesting, particularly about humanity, and maybe you've never thought about this, but one of the beautifully complicated things about humanity is that we all have a voice, right? That we all have a voice, that we all want somebody to listen to our voice. Uh, You've probably uh, known people that have, you know, banded together so that they will hear their voice, so people will hear their voice because they feel like their voices aren't being heard. Maybe you grew up in a family where you felt like you didn't have much of a voice because all they were talking and people were loud and there was a constant, you know, you had to interrupt if you were going to be heard. And so you had to make your voice known if you were going to have a voice. But we all have a voice. We all want our voices to be heard. Voices are such a fascinating, powerful thing, and and the fact that we all have voices adds to the complication of voices, right? Because sometimes voices say things that we don't like to hear. (laughs) Have you ever wanted to mute somebody else's voice? You know what I'm talking about? You have those moments where you just wish you had a remote control. It could be like, boop, you know, we're done listening to you. Uh, Sometimes we want to mute people's voices in our culture today. I was thinking about politicians. Oh my goodness. How, I mean, how much of us wish we could mute that? Or what about, you know, parents, parents. Have you ever wanted to mute your kids' voices like early in the morning when they're screaming first thing in the morning? Not that anybody's living through that right now. Um, But, you know, we want to wake up and mute, 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 or at least turn the volume down a little bit on that voice. Or sometimes as teenagers, you know, you want to mute your parents' voices, right? As they talk to you about getting a job and, you know, being more respectful or, you know, working harder or, you know, doing better in school. We like to mute different voices. Sometimes it's a friend or a coworker. I mean, there are just lots of voices. And in today's technological age, it makes it a little easier to mute voices, right? I mean, we can at least turn the volume off the television or we can unfriend or unfollow or un whatever it is that we need to do so that we silence the voices that we don't want to hear because the truth is sometimes voices say painful things, right? Sometimes voices say things that make us uncomfortable, maybe things that we don't really want to hear, I don't know if you've ever had that experience before of somebody who was maybe supposed to be a friend or a relative or somebody who cared about you who ended up saying something that was painful and you've carried that with you for years and years and years and it's infected you. It has affected you in such a significant way. Maybe it's affected the way that you eat. Maybe it's affected the way that you look at yourself when you look in the mirror. Maybe it's affected the way that you parent or affected the way that you're in a marriage, in your marriage. It's affected the way that you work and your work ethic. Voices are so powerful. Voices are so powerful, and they play like recordings in our minds, influencing us weeks, months, years after we've even heard them. I'm curious what you do and how you respond when you hear a painful voice. What do you do in those moments? Yeah, turn your hearing aid off. That's a good answer. (laughs) Push that mute button, okay? Yeah. What else do you do? I mean, sometimes, sometimes we want to silence them. We want to hit the mute button. Or sometimes, I don't know if you've ever done this before, you just kind of, um, you, you discard it. Or you, you point a flaw out in the person who delivered that message to you. You say, you know, the, it was maybe partially true, but because it was only partially true, you can throw the whole thing out. 
or the environment in which it was spoken to you, maybe the environment in which it was spoken to you it was embarrassing because there were other people around and so you just think, I'm not having anything to do with that and we wanna push voices away sometimes. But here's the thing, and, and we all know this, because we all have a voice, we've all used our voices in other people's lives before. And there have been times, my guess is, in your life where you have spoken something to someone and you had the best intentions. In fact, because you were not living their life, you had the outside perspective and you could see things a little bit differently and you spoke something to someone that they maybe even needed to hear. But they didn't receive it well, right? I mean, because they saw it as a voice of attack. They saw it as a voice that was trying to hurt them or to harm them and they shut it off. But you know that if they had listened, I think sometimes, particularly as parents, you know, this is something I've experienced as parents, if you would only do what I'm telling you to do. I mean, I can see something that you cannot see. I have a different perspective. We recognize that there are times when voices say painful things, but it's the exact thing we need to hear. In fact, sometimes God uses voices to say things that we don't want to hear. Even if they're painful. I remember when I was in elementary school, fifth grade, it was, I was in art class, Mr. Craig, it was the very end of the school year, and we were doing this kind of art project, and um, I wanted a little bit more of whatever it was we were working on, and so I went up to Mr. Craig and I said, you know, can I have some more? And he looked me in the face and he said, Seth, can't you ever be satisfied? And 30 years later, I still remember that voice, and to be quite honest with you, he spoke something that I needed to hear nearly 30 years ago. Can't you ever be satisfied? Because there's a piece in me that believes if I just get a little bit more, I'll finally have whatever it is that I want or whatever it is that I need. But yet, what I've discovered as an adult is that it's a dangling carrot that I will never, ever reach. More is never enough. And he recognized that in fifth grade, and he spoke it to me. And so there are times when there are voices that speak things to us that we need to hear. In fact, I think one of the dangers of our culture right now is with the technological ability to mute voices and turn off voices that we don't like. I mean, one of the wonderful things about living in the United States is that we have freedom of speech, that everybody has a voice, everybody's allowed to speak. But as soon as we begin silencing voices and hitting the mute button on voices, what we discover is that there are times when we shut out the voice of God. Because God is always speaking, and oftentimes God is speaking through voices that we hear. In fact, the Christian perspective is this, is that sometimes there's a voice behind the voice. Sometimes it's not just simply a random person talking, but God wants to use that voice in our lives and in our hearts to move us forward and to speak something that we need to hear. And yet we can all say, and we all know, that sometimes the voices we hear are simply the voices of fools. <laughs> so how do we measure the, between the two? How do we figure out what voice we're listening to? Is it the voice of God, or is it simply the voice of a fool? And that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. I hope it's something that will be helpful to you. I certainly know it's been helpful to me as I've moved forward in my faith journey. Now, in order to do this and talk about this, I wanna take a look at a story that's from the Old Testament. If you've got your Bible, you may wanna open it up. We're gonna be in the book of Second Samuel, 2 Samuel's uh, kind of in the middle of the Old Testament before the book of Psalms, so if you get there, move left. If you didn't bring a Bible, don't worry, we'll have it up on the screen. And this story involves David's mo- or Israel's most famous king, whose name was David. Now, last week we looked at a story that took place before David took the royal throne, and this is a story that took place when David nearly lost <laughs> the royal throne. So we're fast-forwarding his life a little bit. And I'll be honest, I've got to give a lot of backstory here, so don't, don't like fall asleep on me. It's really important and I'm going to do my best to uh, make it as succinct as possible. But let me say this. um, It is a fascinating story. And if you, you know, you feel like the Bible isn't true or you have questions about whether or not the Bible is real or even if you're a Bible reader, I would encourage you, read this story, okay? Spend some time, whether it's today, later on today or in the coming week, reading through the book of 2 Samuel because it is so rich. And my guess is you'll find things in there that surprise you and you may um, even say, wow, I believe that, (laughs) you know, even though I didn't think I would believe anything in the Old Testament. So uh, take a look at that, 2 Samuel. Now, let me give you, again, a bit of the backstory. It actually starts when David was king of Israel. He was the most loved, beloved king. He was a man after God's own heart. And yet David used the privilege of his position to do something very terrible. He took another man's wife. Her name was Bathsheba. 
and Bathsheba came to him. They had a romantic relationship. And then there was an uh uh-oh situation where Bathsheba became pregnant. And her husband was off at war serving King David, doing what King David wanted him to do, leading the army. And uh, Bathsheba, his wife, suddenly is impregnated by the king. And it's like, what do you do, you know? So David decided to do a hack job on the cleanup, and he had her husband killed in battle. So suddenly, David kills her husband, and he welcomes Bathsheba as one of his wives. (laughs) This was at a time where people had multiple wives, and we're not going to go into all of that. Let's just suffice it to say it's better when men only have one wife, okay? (laughs) We'll just leave it at that. Better when men have one wife. And so so, uh, what this created was a lot of problems in David's life because our choices have consequences. Our choices have consequences. Good choices have good consequences. Sinful choices have consequences sinful consequences and and painful consequences. And one of the consequences of David's choice was that this child that he had with Bathsheba died in, um, in infancy. And another consequence is that the rest of his family began to fall apart. Now, because he had multiple wives, uh, Bathsheba was one of the eight named wives that David had in the Old Testament. Now, that doesn't mean his other wives weren't named. We think he maybe had other wives, but they probably had names. We just don't know what they are. It wasn't like wife number 10. <laughs> you know, they had names. So, so anyway, um, along with that, that meant he had children from multiple wives, and he had one son whose name was Amnon. Amnon was his very first son. And then Amnon had a half-sister, named Tamar, and Tamar had a full brother whose name was Absalom. So you've got Amnon and then Tamar and Absalom, and Amnon decided that he was in love with his half-sister. Now, even 3,000 years ago, that is not appropriate, and yet he devised a scheme that he would uh, pretend to be sick, and he would ask Tamar to come and care for him, and so he brought her into his room, and he sent all the attendants out, and he said to Tamar, come to bed with me, and she says, there's no way I'm coming to bed with you. That's not right. And he said, no, come to bed with me. She says, no. He says, no, really, come to bed with me. And she says, well, let's talk to the king at least, you know, get permission. And he said, no. And then he sexually assaulted her. And as often happens in such sordid situations, he was disgusted by her afterward. And he threw her out. And in a moment's time, he stole from her her virginity. He stole from her her hope of a royal wedding because non-virgin daughters were not allowed to have a royal wedding. And he really stole from her her future. And King David did literally nothing. He didn't have the moral authority to do anything. And Absalom, her brother, was furious. And so he decided that he would kill his brother. And so he plotted and planned and ended up killing Amnon. And then he fled from Jerusalem for fear of what King David would do to him. So so Absalom flees from Jerusalem And over time, King David's heart softened to his son, and he was allowed to come back into the kingdom, but it was under the understanding that um, you can be present physically, but emotionally, I want nothing to do with you. And as you might imagine, that was amazingly painful for Absalom, who's welcomed into the kingdom, but not allowed to even speak to his father. And so he mounted an uprising. And over a period of time, he began swaying the hearts of Israel away from his father, David, who was this beloved king, in the direction of him. And there was one particular day where he had 200 people from Jerusalem in the city of Hebron. Hebron was kind of this religious center and uh, epicenter of Israel. And, and he, he made this decree that when the, the trumpet sounds, I want all of you to declare that Absalom is king in Hebron. And they did. And word came to David, and the tides began shifting away from David and toward Absalom. And so David, not wanting any more bloodbath, he did the thing that many of us wouldn't do. He didn't fight for the throne. He left. And he took his whole household with him. He took his army with him. And they began exiting Jerusalem. And as they were leaving, there was a voice that began speaking to King David. And it's that voice that I want us to take a look at. So sorry for the big backstory, but it's kind of important to get where we're going this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5 is where we pick up the story. So as King David approached Bahurim, which was a village in the Benjamite territory, a man from the same clan as Saul's family, so he's a relative of Saul, and you may or may not know, but Saul was the first king of the nation of Israel, okay? A man from Saul's family, same clan as Saul's family, came out from there, 
His name was Shimei, son of Gera, and he cursed as he came out. Now, Saul was the first king, and it was believed by some that David had um, uprooted Saul as king, that David was responsible for Saul's death. That's actually not what happened at all. Saul was killed in battle along with his son, Jonathan. In fact, David had gone to great lengths to protect Saul. David had several opportunities to kill Saul, and he did not kill him. In fact, his men wanted him to kill him, and David said, I'm not going to touch God's anointed leader of this country. David had great respect for Saul, and even when David and Saul were killed in battle, or I'm sorry, um, Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle, David welcomed Jonathan's son named Mephibosheth into the kingdom, which was a big risk on his part. Mephibosheth was a person who was injured um, during the whole ordeal of, of David and or of, of Saul and Jonathan being killed. And so there's this situation where this man's coming out, he begins cursing David because he's got to be in his bonnet about Saul losing the kingship. And verse 6 we read, he pelted David. He pelted David and all the king's officials with stones. <laughs> if you can just imagine this situation. Going on it says, Um, though all the troops and the special guard were on David's right and left. So his whole army was there. It's like the president, you know, with secret service surrounding him, walking out, and somebody standing up on a rooftop, like throwing stones at him, if you can only imagine. Um, It says, "As, as he cursed, Shimei said, get out, get out, you murderer, you scoundrel. Now, the problem with Shimei's voice in this moment is that right now, right here, he's speaking some truth, isn't he? That's why we told that whole backstory of David and Bathsheba. I mean, he was a murderer. He killed Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. He was a scoundrel. He covered the whole thing up. I mean, honestly, in today's day and age, I don't want to get all political, but I mean, talk about impeachment. I mean, this is like lock you up, put you behind bars. It was terrible what he did. And so he starts off with the, the, this, these words that touch a painful part of David's past and address a piece of him that perhaps was a barely closed up wound if closed up at all. And he did it in such a way that everyone could hear it. All the people who were surrounding him, his army who was willing to stick with him. And yet he's screaming out and yelling out these things for all to hear. He goes on, he says, the Lord has, what's that word underlined? Repaid. The Lord has repaid you. In other words, David, don't get angry at me. This is your fault. Don't get angry at God. This is your fault. God is simply repaying you. It's kind of the concept of karma. What goes around comes around, you know. God is repaying you for what you have done. Then he goes on. He says, the Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul. Now that's kind of where things take a bit of a twist because David was a murderer and he was a scoundrel, but he didn't shed any blood in the household of Saul. This is where kind of the fairy tale picks up, the, the, the falsehoods. He says, for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in whose place you have reigned, the Lord has given the kingdom into the hands of your son Absalom. You have come to, come to ruin because you are a murderer. That's so interesting because suddenly he claims to know the mind of God and he points out, you know, this thing that's part truth, part fairy tale. And David, we know exactly what's going to happen and God's out to get you because of what you've done and dethroning Saul and all this good stuff. And he's so quick to point a finger. Meanwhile, David's right there. I mean, if you can just imagine the situation, the grief that he's experiencing, I mean, the sadness as they depart out of the city, his whole army right there listening. Verse 9, we read, Then Abishai, son of Zariah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and cut off his head. So you thought the Old Testament couldn't be interesting, right? And he wasn't exaggerating. I mean, this wasn't, you know, he literally wanted to go cut off his head. This would not be the first head that David would have cut off. It would not have been the first head that any of his men had cut off. In fact, the first head that we know of that David cut off was the giant Goliath. You probably know that story. And David, with a sling and a stone, slayed Goliath, and then he was dead, and then David cut off his head, and he carried it around. And you know why he carried it around? Because there were no pictures, right? I mean, you had to prove that you actually killed the person, and so people want to see. You know, I've got the head of the giant right here. It was, life was not valued, you know, the same way it is now, 3,000 years ago. And so, so, you know, David, 
just let us at him. I mean, he's got a whole line of guys who are lined up, ready to take the head off of this guy if he will only allow. Now let me ask you a question. What would you do in this situation? Or maybe a better question is, what have you done, you know, in this situation? You've probably not actually cut off somebody's head, I hope, right? Maybe you've bit off somebody's head. You ever have one of those moments where somebody says something that you don't want to hear and you hear their voice and you just like unleash (laughs) a fury on them and you say what you need to say because you're going to get back at them for the very thing that they said that was hurtful to you? Or sometimes we just do it online, you know, we hide behind the screen. We're not bold enough to go throw rocks, physical rocks at somebody and their entire army. You know, we just do it online where they can't get back at us. Or we ice them out or, you know, give them the cold shoulder or we push the mute button, we unfriend, unfollow, and whatever else. I mean, we, we, we try to silence and get away from. And yet, that's not what David did. So interesting. Look, verse 10. It says, but the king said, what does this have to do with you, you sons of Zariah? I mean, he turns his attention away from Shimei, and he turns it to the guys who are trying to defend him, who are trying to stand up for him, who are whispering in his ear, which we've all had that, you know, tear them apart. You know, you can't take this. You've got to say something back. You've got to do something back to them. He turns to the guys. He's like, guys, calm down. Settle down. He says, if he is cursing because the Lord said to him, curse David, who can ask, why do you do this? I mean, guys, it's possible that God is the one who put those words in his mouth. It's possible that God is the one who is sending this message for me because it's something that I need to hear. Guys, so who are we to say? Who are we to point a finger? Who are we to silence the voice? It could be the voice of God. See, from David's point of view, if we mute painful voices, we may also be muting God's voice. If we mute painful voices, we may simply be muting God's voice in our lives because David understood that God speaks through people. Not always. Sometimes voices are just fools. God does speak through people, though, and if we are quick to silence voices that we do not want to hear, we will be quick to shut out the voice of God. And we may well be missing the very things that God wants to speak to us. So who are we? (laughs) Who are we to ask, why do you do this? Verse 11, David then said to Abishai and all his officials, My son, my own flesh and blood is trying to kill me. How much more than this Benjamite? Leave him alone, let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. I'm not going to mute painful voices. Now, David's perspective on this situation is so fascinating because all throughout David's life, what you begin to realize is that David understood he was simply a steward of the things that God had placed under his care. He was not an owner. They were not his to keep. He was simply a steward, which is what made him so loved by so many people. And so he said, if God's ready to take this kingdom from me, who am I to step in that way? Who am I to to speak against that? Who am I to shut down the voice that's wanting to bring that out? He said this, verse 12, it may be, in other words, it's not guaranteed, but it's possible, it may be that the Lord will look upon my misery and restore to me his covenant blessing instead of his curse today. And so David and his men continued along the road while Shimei was going along the hillside opposite him, cursing as he went and throwing stones at him and showering him with dirt. (laughs) Unbelievable. That's a great story, isn't it? You should take some time to read your Old Testament. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I want to tell you how I first became acquainted with this story. It took place about eight years ago. Uh, My wife Carrie and I were getting ready to go on the mission field to Brazil. I was a pastor of students at a church, and during my last year as leading the student ministry at our church, there was kind of a transition period where I helped to train the person who was going to take over me, and the person who was going to take over my role was a young guy just out of college, good-looking, smart, intelligent, you know, that's smart. Um, He was, you know, musical, he was athletic, the kids loved him, the kids loved him. I mean, he was so talented in many different ways. 
And over time, I began hearing voices. Sometimes they were audible voices coming from other people. Sometimes it was just as I was driving in the car, I'd hear kind of a voice inside my spirit that was saying to me something along the lines of, Seth, they can't wait for you to leave. Seth, you know, they're counting down the days. They're ready for, for him to take over. They just can't wait for your replacement to come. So hurry up and go and get out of here. And it was painful voices because I'd poured my life into these kids for six years. And part of our role as we went on the mission field with pioneers was we had to go to something called pre-field connection. And that pre-field connection for a week, we learned how to be missionaries essentially and what to do on the mission field and stuff like that. And um, there was a pastor who led daily devotional things in the morning. And so one day I just said to him, can, can, we, can I talk to you about some of these voices that I'm hearing? And he introduced me to this story, and it was a story that I had heard before. I'd certainly read it probably half a dozen times, but I never took the time to appreciate what David was going through in those moments, the pain of the voices that he was hearing. And I came to this realization that David truly wanted to hear God's voice. My guess is that's probably true for you, too, that you want to hear God's voice. I think you probably wouldn't be here unless somebody dragged you and promised you, you know, lunch afterward or something, which is a good way to drag people here. But my guess is, just like you and me, you know, we want to hear God's voice. And sometimes the voice of God is painful. Sometimes it's painful. If you're making decisions that are taking you outside of God's plans for your life and somebody confronts that or somebody says something about it and, you know, it, it kind of is off-putting, isn't it? I mean, it, it makes you cringe a little bit and say, you know, I don't want to hear you. I want to shut down that voice. It may be painful to hear. As a parent, as I said earlier, you know, growing up as a kid, there were times when my parents said painful things to me. We're teachers, we're coaches, we're people who cared about me. We're the voice of God in my life speaking things that I needed to hear even though they were painful. And David recognized that. He recognized that and he said, I'm not going to silence other voices. In fact, what David did was he held his hands wide open and said, God, whatever it is that you want for me, that's what I want. Whatever it is that you want for me, that's what I want. But the problem with that is it's scary, isn't it? In fact, when we choose not to mute voices, it removes our control. It takes it out of our hands. We've been talking about this over the last month or so. When, when we remove our control, it's in an uncomfortable place. In fact, just a side comment, one of my concerns about our culture right now is that we will not listen to opposing voices because we can't control them. We can't control them. And so we don't want to hear what they have to say. And yet David understood that there are times when voices speak that we don't want to hear, and yet there is a voice behind that voice that wants us to listen. That wants to speak something true to us. And I don't know why you mute voices. I was thinking about why, reasons why David could have muted these voices, you know, because of the, the person who was delivering it. You know, he, you did this in front of all my friends, you know, in front of my entire army. You embarrassed me at a time where I'm already embarrassed about everything that's going on in the kingdom. So, psh, you know, cut off with your head. Or you said something that was partially true but not fully true, and because of that, I'm just going to throw the whole thing out. I don't want to hear anything that you have to say. David could have done that, but he chose not to. He chose not to because he recognized that it could be the voice of God who's speaking to him. I realize that some of you may be thinking in your mind, you know, Seth, I've heard some painful voices in my past, voices that I have carried with me my entire life. And you know what? You're right, I don't know some of those voices, but I know my own set. <laughs> We've all got our own set of painful voices. And the thing that I discovered in the midst of the stress of trying to understand voices was just a simple prayer that I want to share with you this morning. And there's nothing magical about it. It's not a perfect prayer, but I think this prayer helped me in those moments to recognize this very thing that David recognized, that this could be the voice of God, and I want to pay attention to it. And so the prayer is simply this, God, help me to hear your voice and help me to believe what's true. God, help me to hear your voice 
and help me to believe what's true because there may be other voices out here. There may be things that aren't true. But more than anything, I want to hear you. And I want to believe what's true about what you have to say. And the thing that I discovered is that when I began praying that prayer eight years ago, that those other voices that weren't necessarily from God, they began to fade away. And the truth was, there were some things in my character, there were some things in my leadership that God wanted to hone and strengthen and develop and address in those moments, and I needed to hear those. But many of the voices were not the voice of my Heavenly Father speaking into me. And the beautiful thing about that prayer is when we invite God into that place to speak a voice of truth into us, the thing that we discover is that God is for us. God is for us. If you never hear anything else in all the times that you come here on Sunday mornings, I hope you hear that there is a God who is for you. And he demonstrated his love for you by sending Jesus for you. In the most famous verse of Scripture, that God so loved the world, for he gave his one and only Son. And when we recognize that voice... When we recognize that voice that is in our court, that is for our benefit, it helps us to move forward. And it helps us to sort out all the other voices of pain. And it could be in your life, as you hear different voices, as you've got different recordings in your mind, it could be that you are hearing the voice of God. It could also be that you're hearing the voice of a fool. That was the case with David. Shimei was nothing more than a fool. David's son Absalom ended up being killed in battle. The throne was never taken from David, but David went to his his deathbed knowing the pain that he caused his family and many other people as a consequence of his decisions. And yet he still recognized God may be speaking to me through this. And so I want to hear the voice of God. So I wonder as we bring things to a close this morning, what voices you've heard What voices you've heard in your life? Would you be willing to allow God to help you discern those voices before you discard them? Because if you just discard them, you may be discarding the voice of God that needs to speak something to you. But would you be willing to bring it before your Heavenly Father? In fact, in our closing moments here, Barry's going to come up with the band and and lead us in a song. It may be a time for you to think about a voice you've heard in the last week. Maybe it was 30 years ago that's been playing like a recording in your mind. Would you just bring that voice before God and invite him into that space? Say, God, help me to hear your voice and help me to believe what's true. And it's in that place that I believe our Heavenly Father meets us and that he communicates his great love for us, and he also helps us move forward. And he silences the voices of pain that we do not need to hear. Let me pray for us. God, I just thank you so much uh, for the voices that have spoken into my life, even voices that are painful to hear unfriendly fire, people who didn't even have good intentions for me, and yet you used them to speak something to me. And God, my guess is in a room this size, there are plenty of people in here who have voices that are swimming around in their minds, playing like recordings over and over and over again, and I just ask that you would give them the courage to bring those voices to you, and with open hands invite you into that space that they would hear your voice, and that they would know and believe what's true. God, thank you for David's willingness to hold his life with open hands. Thank you in spite of his mistakes and failures, being a man after your own heart. Would it be true for each of us that we would be people after your heart, that we would desire to hear your speaking voice in our lives, and that when we hear it, we'd be willing to listen. So thanks for this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.